Rob Dunn is a professor of applied ecology at North Carolina State University and the Center for Evolutionary Hologenomics at the University of Copenhagen. He received his PhD for ecology and evolution at the University of Connecticut. He is the author of Never Home Alone from Microbes to Millipedes, Camel Crickets and Honeybees, The Natural History of Where We Live, published in 2018, along with four other titles. He also has a book coming out later this year entitled A Nat Natural History of the Future, What the Laws of Biology Tell Us About the Destiny of the Human Species. The book, Delicious, The Evolution of Flavor and How It Made Us Human, co-authored with Monica Sanchez, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Rob Dunn. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be here. And I am really looking forward to this evening. It's uh, 1.30 a.m. for me, or it's 2 a.m. now. And so uh, if I suddenly stop making sense... I apologize, but I should be good. For a very long time, artists and writers have been putting flavor and deliciousness first in their work. So we can think about the history of still life, for example, which is which is the story of, of making central food and deliciousness and the pleasures of food. We can also think about poems. There are many, many poems in which food takes a center stage. For example, William Carlos Williams, and this is just to say, writes, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. Or uh, Gully Canal writes, I love to go out in late September among the fat overripe, icy black blackberries to eat blackberries for breakfast, the stalks very prickly, a penalty they earn for knowing the black art of blackberry making. And as I stand among them, lifting the stalks to my mouth, the ripest berries fall almost unbidden to my tongue as words sometimes do, certain peculiar words like strengths or, or squinched, many lettered one syllabled lumps, which I squeeze squinch open and splurge well in the silent startled icy black language of blackberry eating in late September. Or, or this other poem by William Carlos Williams, which I really enjoy to, to a poor old woman, munching a plum on the street, a paper bag of them in her hand, they taste good to her. They taste good to her. They taste good to her. You can see it by the way she gives herself to the one half sucked out in her hand, comforted, a solace of ripe plums seeming to fill the air. They taste good to her. And I bring these poems and, and this art up today because what Monica Sanchez and I try to do in our new book, Delicious, The Evolution of Flavor and How It Made Us Human, is to revisit the human story with the same attention to flavor and deliciousness that Williams offers the plum or Canel offers the blackberries. In short, we consider why it tastes good to her, but also why it matters that it does. What I'll be talking about today is, is sort of half of this book and an argument that plays out over half of the book. And that argument is in many, um, is that in many of the key transitions in human evolution, flavor played a role. And when confronted with a more delicious food and a less delicious food, our ancestors tended to choose the more delicious food. They chose what tasted good to them and from such choices much follows. In this context, there are sort of seven big mysteries in the book. Uh, I'm not gonna have a chance to talk about all of them today. And so I'm gonna focus today on stick tools, big brains, fire, and culinary traditions. And you can ask me about some of the other things later if there's time. The caveat is that I won't resolve or solve any of these mysteries, but my hope is instead to shed new light on them and in doing so to start new conversations that then lead to solutions and resolutions, which is unsatisfying, but I'm a scientist. Like we're never totally satisfying with regard to our ability to answer things. Uh, it's the nature of the beast. Starting with stick tools, 
we've learned a lot in recent years about the ways in which many species use sticks as tools. And one of the things that allows us to do is also to think about how our ancestors might have used stick tools. And some of what we've learned in recent years has been because of things like this. This is a camera trap. And scientists have been able to put these camera traps out in the forest and sort of see tool use in nature that could never be documented before because it was happening, for example, in, in populations that humans couldn't get close to of chimpanzees. And one of the most amazing projects in in this regard is a project led by this team at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, and it's the Pan-African Program. And it's a project where they put out camera traps across Africa and uh, around populations of chimpanzees, and, and then videoed what was happening at those camera traps when the chimpanzees and other animals were moving. And you can actually help with this project. If you go to Chimp and C, you can help go, go through these videos. And what's amazing about the videos is sometimes you see an elephant, sometimes you see a a gorilla, and sometimes you see a totally new kind of tool use that as you're working with the project, you're the first one ever to see. And so it's really very exciting. And to give you a flavor of the kind of things that are being seen, I wanna show you a video that includes examples of stick and stone tool use as documented by this project. And so what you're gonna see are sort of very brief vignettes of chimpanzees doing different amazing things is with tools that they have fashioned. And, in, and it's mostly as tools. There's one little brief snippet where you're gonna see a chimpanzee throwing rocks into a tree. This happens in multiple chimpanzee populations. Nobody really has any idea why they do it. Uh, it's, it's a mystery we can talk about later. It's certainly not about flavor. So it's not our mystery for the day, but, but here we go. So I'm just gonna let you watch for a second and, and I'll be quiet while you do. So these videos are both, they're fascinating in and of themselves. They're fascinating in terms of what they show us about chimpanzees and what they can do. Um, but they also present a mystery. And the mystery is why are the chimpanzees using all these tools when other species that can don't necessarily. But, and and they, they present us with that mystery also in the context of our own ancestry. And to explain that a little bit, I'm gonna um, show a, a slide that gives some context into our relationship with chimpanzees and other living uh, species of our relatives. And so what this shows are chimpanzees which are, and bonobos, which are a species of the genus Pan, gorillas, orangutans, and gibbons. And this is a family tree. And so we're most closely related to chimpanzees here, less closely related to gorillas and so on. And, and this then on the, uh, this axis shows a measure of time. How long ago did our common ancestor live? And what we know in the context of this family tree is that all of these species use stick tools at least sometimes. What we also know is that chimpanzees and our own species, we use stick tools very often. And so what we can infer is that it's probably pretty likely that our common ancestor with chimpanzees also used tools pretty often. And so if we're interested in the mystery of, of why species use tools in these ways, it's also a mystery that relates to our own ancestors and why, why they might have used tools in these ways. And one of the ways we can think about these kinds of tool use in our ancestors is to actually find those tools. And so for example, these are bone tools, not stick tools, but they're very similar to stick tools. And it's, it's now well supported that these tools, which are from 1.2 to 2 million years ago, were used to get termites out of termite mounds. And so they were used in exactly the same way that chimpanzees now use tools to get termites out of termite mounds. But the trick with studying tools like this as a window into that early tool use is there aren't many of them. 
For obvious reasons, stick tools break down over time. They disappear. And so we just have very narrow windows into that past. And in this context, chimpanzees are actually really interesting to study both for their own right and to understand ourselves because they provide us much more context into how our ancestors might have used tools. And they can help us think about the question, why did our ancestors innovate stick tools? And so the, to the extent that there's a standard answer to this question, it's that they use stick tools to get more calories, to feed their ever larger brains, brains that require lots of energy. In short, they optimized. Now, this is always to me a kind of dissatisfying answer because it sort of assumes that chimpanzees and our ancestors are, are like robots. They go onto the environment and they choose things perfectly, which has various problems. One of which is uh, it, it assumes they're always doing the right thing and that they wanna do the right thing. And the other is that somehow they can measure exactly what they need to do. I think both, both Monica and I think in, in arguing this book that it's far more likely that the proximate cue that, that chimpanzees and our ancestors used to think about the use of tools is not optimization, but deliciousness. And, and we began to wonder as we were writing the book, if maybe what was going on this was that our ancestors used stick tools to get more tasty foods, and then those foods happened to have more calories. This is a subtle difference, but it turns out to have all sorts of consequences, and it's kind of fun to explore. Just as some quick background to make sense of what I'm about to tell you, I need to give you some terminology that relates to words we use all the time, but we don't use them in quite the same way that scientists necessarily use them. Uh, and so first, taste. When I use the word taste, I mean to refer just to the sensations that are experienced on the tongue via taste receptors. And so it's sweet, it's sour, it's salty, it's umami. Mouthfeel, on the other hand, which is a real word, it's a weird word, but it's the sense of touch in the mouth. And so when you, when you eat an avocado and there's that kind of smooth, wonderful feel, that's mouthfeel. It's, it's the texture and it, in, in and of itself, it can be pleasing. And then there are retronasal aromas. And this is the sense of smell as perceived in the mouth. And so when you eat something, you close your mouth, you're chewing, the, the, the aroma molecules of that food item go up the, the back of your mouth and into the back of your nose and you smell them. That's a retronasal aroma. Chemisthesis, I won't talk about it today, but it's interesting to know, is it totally different sense? And it relates to spicy chilies, cool mints, these all do a totally different chemical thing in our mouth. Uh, it's, it's really quite intriguing. And then flavor is all of these things together. Flavor is this sort of summary experience. It's not one sense, but it's, it's, the, it's the entirety. You know, it's, it's you stand before the art of the food and, and what it is that you perceive. With regard to tool use, our thinking is that taste is actually maybe the most important thing. And so we think that tool use is really about getting tasty, tasty foods. But if that's the case, how could we possibly know? What, what would it look like if that were the case? To explain our answer to that, I need to back up a little bit and think about a time hundreds of millions of years ago when our ancestors, our vertebrate ancestors were evolving in the ocean. When they were evolving in the ocean, they evolved in such a way to take advantage of which uh, elements were most common in the ocean. And so if we look at a chart like this one that, that shows the percent by mass of different elements in ocean water, and then the percent by mass of those elements in humans, and the y-axis here could be humans, it could be rats, it could be fish even, it, it's very similar. What we see is things that were common in ocean water are common in our bodies because our bodies evolved to take advantage of that commonness. Now, the trick is that about 380 million years ago, the, the, the first uh, terrestrial leaning fish begun, begins to crawl ashore and its descendants eventually come to eat plants and to live in a very different environment. And suddenly all those things that were common in the ocean are no longer so common in the average terrestrial diet which presents all kinds of problems. And so if you look at this figure, the x-axis, the horizontal axis, shows the percent by mass of each of these elements in animals. 
And, and so you, you see this for fish, for mammals, for insects, they're color coded, but you can just look at the, the black circles. Those are the averages. And so in that context, there's a lot of carbon in animals. There's way less magnesium. You get the sense of how this, this goes. The y-axis, the up and down axis, is the percent, percent difference between plants and animals. And so if something is really high on this axis, it's way more common in animals than in plants. And so the trick is, if you're a land animal eating some plants and some animals, how do you possibly know that you need to get way more uh, sodium, Na, or phosphorus, P, or nitrogen, N, or calcium? You know, how does the raccoon, it's not like the raccoon has a little chemistry set and they can go out and figure this out. And this is where taste comes in. Because taste is, is really a very simple system that leads animals toward those things that ancestrally they have tended to need. It's not about what you need today, it's about what your ancestors have tended to need. And so salt taste receptors reward animals for finding that sodium. Umami taste receptors reward animals for finding nitrogen. We have calcium taste receptors, they've recently been discovered. It's not totally clear, but it appears maybe they play a role and telling animals they found calcium. And it turns out that some mammals have phosphorus taste receptors. It's still not totally clear if humans do, but if they do, maybe it's part of the same system. And just to give you a sense, I know not everybody has heard of all of these tastes. So umami, for example, this is a taste that you can experience if you eat a dashi broth with kombu algae. It's in the algae, it's also in the, in the broth. And it's sort of a perfect representation of what umami taste is like. But you can also just go buy MSG because MSG is, is really pure umami. Uh, and the story of its discovery is pretty wonderful, but for another day. We also have sweet taste receptors. They're a little bit different in that uh, they reward us for finding carbon compounds that are easy to digest, not because we proportionally need so much more of them than a plant has, but because we need them for energy. And so our sweet taste receptors keep telling us, go find more sugar. We have to run your expensive brain. Go find more sugar. And then we have bitter taste receptors, which are the stick in this carrot and stick system. They're a little bit different in that there are actually in humans, 25 different taste receptor types, um, but they're all wired to a single perception. So each type of receptor detects a particular compound. And so that TAS2R38, it detects compounds in brassica plants like Brussels sprouts. And so it's what leads, leads people to detect them as bitter. Uh, but there's just one bitter sensation. So bitter hops, bitter Brussels sprouts, it is the same taste. That we experience them as different is because of aroma and how that plays into this story. But if tool use is about taste, what we would then expect is that the food chimpanzees get with tools should be tastier than those that are otherwise available. But how can we know? We can't really ask the chimpanzees. I mean, there are ways of doing it, but it is tricky. Fortunately, many of our taste receptors are actually quite similar to those of chimpanzees. And so our sweet taste receptors, sour, salt, and umami, umami appear to be either the same or really quite similar to those of chimpanzees. And so when we experience those taste sensations, they, they likely do too, and vice versa. Bitter, on the other hand, is quite different. And so if we experience something as bitter, a chimpanzee might not, and vice versa. But this is really useful because it means that if, an, if a primatologist went around and tasted the, the foods that chimpanzees eat, it would probably be a pretty good representation of, of what those same foods taste like to chimpanzees. But who would do this? It turns out actually lots of people. It's a very popular primatologist hobby. And, and the sort of king of this endeavor uh, was Toshisada Nishida, an amazing primatologist who worked at Mahale Mountain National Park, just south of Gombe, where Jane Goodall worked and started his work there just after Jane Goodall and became interested very early in what the chimpanzees were eating. And so he went around, followed the chimpanzees, and every time they ate something, he ate it too. And so he provides us with this sort of... Uh, you know, uh, critics view of the, of the daily menu of the chimpanzee. And now rem remember that if they have something that 
we perceive as bitter that they eat. We don't know if it's bitter to them. So that doesn't tell us very much. Let's get rid of that. But otherwise, what he found is that some of the things that the chimpanzees were eating were insipid, which is to say they were bland. Some of the things we eat are bland too. Uh, you know, interesting, but not so dissimilar. Some were astringent. Astringency is not a taste, but instead it results from when you have tannins in your mouth and they dry up your saliva. And so if you, uh, some wines are astringent and that kind of puckering, uh, lots of these fruits had. Some were sour, some were sweet and sour, and a lot were sweet. And so superficially, not too bad uh, in terms of taste. And of these, the sweetest fruits were the most preferred, both by Nishida and the chimpanzees. And yet, to Nishida, even the sweets weren't very sweet. And on average, he found the foods of chimpanzees to be at best kind of bland. Like not remarkable. You wouldn't want to eat them all the time. And other chimpanzee bi primatologists who've done the same thing have concluded the same thing. On the other hand, if we look at the food foods that chimpanzees eat with, with stick tools and stone tools, they include foods that humans also love. So humans around the world love chromatogaster ants. They're sour, they have a nice mouth feel. Chimpanzees do too. Humans love algae. It has umami tastes. Chimpanzees do too, or at least some populations. Humans love honey. Honey is far sweeter than anything else in the diet. Chimpanzees do too. Humans like fatty termites. Uh, chimpanzees do too, and humans like to eat mammals, and at least some populations of chimpanzees do too. And so this is in line with what we might expect if, if what these foods are offering to chimpanzees are, are better taste than they otherwise might get. But if taste is the guide rather than optimization, we might expect modern apes to sometimes eat things that taste good but are not good for them. And so are they making mistakes that, that like the mistakes that we make, does this happen? And people haven't looked for this very much, but when they have looked, they find it. And so for example, uh, this map shows sites at which chimpanzees use sticks to eat ants. It's very, very common. But recent research has found no nutritional benefit to eating the ants. It may be that there is one, but nobody's been able to sort it out yet. They're, they're very hard to digest. And so the going conclusion is that they're just snacks. And so the only reason to eat them is they taste good. And so this seems as though it falls into that category. Another example is Vittoria Etienne has done some really amazing work uh, in the Longo Forest in Gabon, where she studies chimpanzees that make tools to pound a hole in the ground to get to ground nesting bees that nest as deep as six feet below the ground. And so she, she watched chimpanzees for a long time um, using camera traps. Uh, so she watched cameras watching chimpanzees uh, to see how they get into these nests and how long it takes. And one thing she knew in advance is that on average, about a half a liter of honey is present in these nests. And so that's like 2000 calories. And it was also clear that when, it, when, that, when that honey is collected, it's divided among multiple individuals. And so the result of all the work is that chimpanzees get like part of a day worth of calories, so not very much. But, but what Vittoria found is that the chimpanzees would take weeks, months, and apparently in some cases even years of pounding into these nests to get to the honey, which is to say they expend far more energy getting to the honey than they get back. And why do they do that? Because it's delicious, uh, or it's tasty at the very least. Another example, Maureen McCarthy and Jack Lester have worked a lot on this Budongo Bogama uh, corridor in Uganda, studying chimpanzees both in forests and sort of at the edge of forests in these habitats that are somewhat agricultural. And what they've seen is that in these areas, even when there's enough forests, some of the chimpanzee populations move into the sugarcane and just spend all day eating sugarcane and more sugarcane and more sugarcane. And then when that, that's done, they go eat some jackfruits. And Maureen and Jack have concluded that it's very unlikely that this much sugar is good for the chimpanzees, but that it's tasty. And so this also looks like a kind of mistake due to this pursuit of taste and more broadly flavor. But the most amazing example in this regard relates to this fruit. 
which when it's ripe, is bright red. It looks like a very sweet fruit. And if you were to taste it, to humans, this fruit tastes sweet. And it's loved by nearly all African primates, including humans. But the trick about this fruit is it does not have sugar. Instead, or very little sugar, it has a protein called brazaine. And that protein, so if you look at the top here, that's a sugar taste receptor. And it has this kind of cup. And the, the way the taste receptor evolves is to catch sugars in the cup and they bind to the receptor and they trigger a signal that goes to your brain that says sweet, sweet, sweet. But this protein, what it does is it sneaks around the side of this receptor and hits it at that kind of elbow and triggers it to say sweet, even though there's nothing sweet there. And the advantage to this for the plant is it can make just a tiny bit of this protein and primates perceive the fruit is very sweet. And so they don't waste much energy on these fruits. The disadvantage to the primate is that the primate gets almost no calories out of these fruits. Just a little bit is digested. And so it's a trick. But does this trick matter? Well, one of the interesting observations that was made a long time ago is that gorillas will examine these fruits, but they don't eat them. And so people started to wonder why this might be. And Elaine Guevara did a study recently in which she showed that the taste receptors for sugar in these gorillas have actually evolved, apparently in response to this plant, in such a way that they're no longer tricked by this protein. That little elbowy part at the bottom is now shaped differently. And what Elaine has concluded is that these gorillas, their ancestors, like the falsely sweet fruit so much that it led their genes to be disfavored. And so imagine a gorilla just sitting by these fruits, eating them all day, indulging the pleasures of their tastes to the extent that it was a cost to its well-being. And that looks like what happened. And then, of course, if we're thinking about examples of primates whose taste buds lead them astray, we have our own daily examples. And so this is the first mystery uh, for today. And we talk about this and all the other mysteries more in the book. The second mystery relates to big brains. This is another view of our family tree. And this one I, I include not just uh, our living relatives, but also some of our extinct relatives. There are many more. We now, we now have a lot of relatives, thanks to a lot of paleoanthropological work recently. And, and this shows the same kind of thing. It's, it shows uh, here we are, Homo sapiens up at the top, here are Neanderthals, um, Homo erectus here. And so you can see our relations. And so you can see the timeline of our, our splits from these, uh, these are our relatives. But what I want to talk about now is that these species up in the top all have really big brains. And this has fascinated evolutionary biologists for a long time. It's one of these self-reflective things that because we're human, because we have big brains, we're interested in, in what leads to big brains. It, it, you know, if, a, if frogs did all the science, it would all be about like, how do you get really good hopping legs? But because it's us, it's all about big brains. And the, the brain size in those species is really sort of extraordinary. This uh, figure shows some of our relatives. You've got chimpanzees at the top, Australopithecus at the top right, Homo habilis. And, and they all kind of have normal mammal skulls, maybe a little on the big side for, um, with regard to brains. But, but if you line them up with a fox and a wolf and a, and a monkey of some kind, they wouldn't look weird. But then you look at these skulls for Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, uh, and Neanderthals, and, we, and there's like a grotesque cranial bulbousness. Our heads are weird. And so this is what people have long wanted to explain, this, this weirdness, how does it arrive? And there's several kinds of how and why here that need to be explained. The first kind that's received the most focus is why were individuals with bigger brains more likely to survive and reproduce? Super interesting, I, I will not be talking about that today. I can talk about it later, but it's not the focus. The second question that comes up a lot is how did individuals get the calories and nutrients they needed for big brains? And 
superficially, there's tons of disagreement about this. And so, for example, Alyssa Cretenden recently argued that maybe honey gathering was really important to this. And our ancestors began to find, began to find ways about 1.9 million years ago when the brain started to get really big. Maybe they found ways to smoke bees or to use chemicals to calm them. And they could suddenly get many more calories from, from honey. Other people like Amanda Henry have wondered whether tool used to smash roots and to smash more nuts freed up calories and it was a that was the big part of the story other people have suggested it was hunting for for various vertebrates or maybe it was fermentation uh we come back to this in the book we won't come back to it tonight or maybe it was gathering muscles and using tools to crack open those muscles and so there's a lot of disagreement people can get really angry about this um paleoanthropologists love to argue in angry ways with each other, but, but it's also kind of a pleasing anger. But all this disagreement hides an agreement. And the agreement is that something about our diets changed. Something about our access to calories changed. And somehow it had to do with food processing, with changing ways of accessing food, whether that was hunting, skinning, cracking open muscles. And so that, that agreement is really interesting. So it's something about this was a culinary innovation. The other question is why did they choose, why did our ancestors choose the foods that provided these calories? What was the immediate decision that that related to? And of course, I'm gonna to argue today that maybe this was that they were more delicious. Maybe that key change was partially about the discovery of ways to find even more delicious food, which happened to have even more calories. And if we look at this figure, I mean, these things don't I mean the honey looks good. I mean, look at the person climbing high and, you know, the, the dangerous bees. This is from a great cave painting in Neolithic Spain. But, but the other things, they don't look so delicious. But if we just reframe these in a modern context, I mean, this is what we're looking at. We're looking at nuts and honey. We're looking at ground roots and maybe with honey. I mean, tapioca is, is ground roots and, and uh, sugar. We're looking at mussels. Think about oysters. And so, so these are potentially really important ancient pleasures. But the other thing in play here, and this is the next mystery, is fire. The trick with fire is timing. Recently, Richard Wrangham, a couple of years ago now, has begun to argue that fire was the key to all of this, that cooking was a great discovery, not merely because it gave us better food or even because it made, it phys made us physically human. It did something even more important it helped make our brains uniquely large, providing a dull human body with a brilliant human mind. Super interesting, uh, well worth thinking about. This has proven enormously controversial to paleoanthropologists and has spurred many graduate students' projects, in part because we really don't know when fire was first controlled. The oldest really well-documented sites for fires controlled are about a million years old. But it's also really hard to document that people were using fire all the time versus they used it sometimes, or maybe there was a chance association. But the thing that's often missed in these debates is that in, in the same argument, Rangham also voiced an uncontested sub-hypothesis, an idea that seems so obvious to people that nobody seems to have argued with it. And the sub-hypothesis is that the reason that our ancestors began to cook was because cooking made things delicious. And so, and so right here at the core of fire is deliciousness again. And this seems to be true. We know that humans prefer cooked food, a cooked sweet potato versus a raw sweet potato. We want the cooked sweet potato. Cooked meat, cooked mammal meat, especially versus raw meat. By and large, societies around the world prefer cooked uh, meat. And it's not just humans, dogs prefer cooked food. Lots of old studies that feed dogs raw meat and cooked meat. And the preference for the cooked meat is greater. Great apes prefer cooked food. So gorillas, chimpanzees like cooked food. And so, so it looks like deliciousness is maybe an important thing here. The weird mystery in this context, because it doesn't seem like a mystery, is why is cooked food delicious? 
And what's intriguing here is it's not just about taste because the sweetness of cooked food versus raw food is not always so different. The sourness, the umaminess, maybe it's sometimes slightly more rich in umami, but not always. And so there, there are a number of hypotheses to explain this, um, one of which was advanced by Harold McGee, who just wrote this beautiful book, Nosedive, that you should check out. And it's the aroma diversity hypothesis. And McGee argues that our ancestors were sort of predisposed to like foods with a diversity of kinds of aroma compounds, because that's what fruits have. An individual fig can have hundreds of different compounds that we're attracted to, argues McGee. And maybe when we cooked meat and we cooked roots, because those cooking processes engender many new smells, it sort of uh, dovetailed with our intrinsic uh, favoring of that diversity. This seems possible, totally untested. Second possibility is that we like cooked foods because of a, of a taste that's kind of a taste, but not a taste, kukumi. Kukumi was discovered in Japan by scientists in 1990. It actually builds on an, an uh, older Japanese sent, uh, sentiment about food called koku. And kukumi is a taste that's um, caused when amino acids, specific in amino acids, interact with calcium taste receptors. And it triggers a kind of fullness around the mouth and it makes flavors last. And it has an effect that's a lot like eating fat. And so it makes food that's not fatty taste fatty. And we know that cooked food has more kukumi. And, and so maybe it was about kukumi. And if you want to experience kukumi, you can, you can take that same, same bowl of uh, broth I mentioned earlier and add an onion to it. Onion and garlic both have the amino acids that trigger kukumi. Or it could be mouthfeel. Cooked food feels better in the mouth. And so it, it might be about that sort of pleasure. The other possibility is, is, is an element of flavor we don't talk about much, but it's just maybe it's less boring. If we look at the amount of time that primates spend feeding and chewing, it scales with body size. And so as primates get bigger, they have to spend more time eating and chewing. And so about 37.5% of the waking hours of chimpanzees are spent chewing. And so cooked foods don't require as much chewing. And so maybe the pleasure of not chewing is part of what's going on here. We, we don't know yet, but, it, but it's, it's an interesting question at the heart of a pretty big change in our, in our history. And th therefore context is how much time we spent chewing. Uh, and my kids spend even less, uh, but, but, but we don't know. And so I think it's interesting to keep thinking about. And the last mystery I'll talk about today is that of culinary traditions. Chimpanzees have culinary traditions, and a good example of them is reflected in differences between Gombe National Park and Mahale National Park. In Gombe National Park, chimpanzees use sticks to eat chromatogaster ants like these and army ants. The same ants are present in Mahale National Park, but instead the chimpanzees use sticks to eat these ants, Campanotis ants. And this difference is not about availability, it's not about dietary need. It is just about the unique cultural traditions of these two populations of chimpanzees. And if we step back and look at chimpanzees in general, the different populations in very similar habitats have different foods that they eat. And so this is really interesting in, in thinking about our own ancestors because those traditions allow in populations lasting cultural adaptation to new environments. And so imagine you move into a new place if, if you can build a new tradition, you can help to eat the right things in that place. And these traditions also lead different populations to eat different foods in similar environments. And so it really helps to, to engender a kind of culinary diversity, which would become especially important as our ancestors began to move around the world. But the trick with all of this is that we need to know how does it happen? How does a chimpanzee population begin to like one ant versus the other? And the good news is we actually know a lot about this, and it relates to olfaction. So olfaction, there are two types. Orthonasal olfaction, that's what the dog's doing here. You sniff the outside world through your nose, and it comes in through your nose. We also have retronasal olfaction. It happens from the mouth going up into the back of the nose. 
if we compare dogs and humans, dogs' noses and heads really feature orthonasal olfaction. They smell the world nose first. The shape of our head actually features retronasal olfaction. And so we argue in the book that humans are probably the species that most depends on retronasal olfaction. We are a species that features flavors. And the really interesting thing about this is that this then feeds into a massive kind of library in our brain. Olfaction, we tend to regard smelling, regard it as not very important, but, but in truth, it's actually probably our most important sense in a lot of ways. Because each time we smell something, it gets a kind of card catalog card in our brain. Uh, and so a card catalog is what helped us before we had computers to find books in the library. So you would have card catalogs sorted by author, you'd have some sorted by title, and you'd have them sorted by subject. And so you could flip through them and find what you wanted. Our brains are the same way with, with smells, but it's a little bit different. Each time we smell something, that experience receives two card catalog cards, in essence. One card is associated with something like the title of the experience, a story recorded as a memory, I was eating cheese with my friend, and, and so on. The second card records the subject, cheese. The more different experiences accumulate in a particular subject, the more finely the subject cards are divided. Also, the less random the connections among subjects become. Cheese has become divided into hard and soft cheeses. Then soft cheeses become divided into blue cheeses. And for example, washed rind cheeses and so on. But there's something else. Each experience is assigned a level of pleasurableness. This is different from the card catalog. But imagine you went to the card catalog and every time you liked a book, you put a sticky note on it. And if you hated a book, you put a different color sticky note. That's what happens in our brains. And so each experience is assigned a level of pleasurableness such that smells that are always associated with pleasurable experiences become good smells and smells associated with bad experiences become bad smells. In essence, it's like a review of the book. And what's amazing is neuroscientists think that there are no intrinsically good or bad aromas, that, are, that we have to learn them all. And so in our lifetime, we categorize the entire aroma world. And so this is really our great library because it allows us to go out in the world and learn things, remember them, record them, categorize them, and then respond to them immediately the next time we encounter them. This great library of, of our, the interface between our brains and our noses. And what's really cool is that this, this isn't something that just happens later in life. It actually begins in utero. And, and so a pregnant mother, uh, what she eats is actually being experienced, those aromas, by the fetus. And so lots of experiments have now been done on this, that, that basically any aromas that the mother is experiencing in her food, the baby learns are good. And so a, in, in utero aroma is a good aroma. And so one classic experiment on this, mother, two groups of mothers, one ate lots of anise while pregnant, the other did not. And then when the babies were born at three hours, they were given a, a Q-tip with anise aroma on it and then a Q-tip or a Q-tip with nothing on it. And then the scientists who did this, Benoit Shaw, looked at how often the babies given the anise aroma licked their lips, which is a sign of pleasure. It's been well-documented sign of pleasure and interest in feeding. And the babies whose moms ate anise licked their lips far more often. The babies whose moms did not eat anise, there was no difference uh, relative to the control with nothing on it. Similarly, the babies whose moms did not eat anise, the, those babies were far more likely to do this face, uh, which obviously indicates displeasure. And so these babies were born having learned what to love. Their mother taught them, even if she didn't mean to. And it's since been shown, this is true for garlic. It's true for fermented fish. It's true for vegetables. It's even true, true for blue cheese. And so this is this amazingly powerful thing where aroma and the learning system associated with it allows culinary traditions that help their ancestors to learn about each new place. They would also come to shape the foods that our ancestors would come to create anew using new kinds of tools in each place. And so this then leads into the other things we consider in the book that reflect this diversification of foods as people move around the world. 
And we also talk about food sharing and, and weird fruits and spicing and the history of cheese. And I won't be able to get to it tonight, uh, but, but please ask questions if you have them. And in conclusion, that's the end of the mysteries for today. I don't imagine that Monica and I have resolved any of them fully. That's not our goal. But we do hope that you see the ways in which considering flavor shines a new light on these mysteries. And all of the stories I've told today are considered in more detail in the book. So, so th thank you very much. And I think we'll now switch to some questions. We'll have a little drink of something. Hey, yeah. Olivia. Thank you so much. Um, so we had a couple of questions from the audience, but you answered them as you went through your, your presentation. So <laughs> covered a lot there. Um, I'm mostly interested in um, some of the questions around what you think about these things, your personal, maybe non-science hat opinion. Um, maybe an, an easy one to start with is um, what's your favorite food that you think is, you know, has no nutritional value? Like what's, what's the thing you would go to if you could eat it and, and it didn't matter? Oh, I don't know why it came to me right then, but so, I mean, I don't, stinky tofu, I think is an amazing, so I think from spending so much time thinking about the complexities of food, I became really interested in foods that have these complexities that like involve learning and uh, complex microbes. And so there are a whole bunch of kinds of fermented tofu that, that are actually very similar to some of the washed rind cheeses. And, and so I find them both like amazing and uh, delicious, but also intellectually, they're kind of sublime because two totally different cultures converged on a very similar kind of food. And so that's the one that comes to mind right now. That's a weird answer, but it's also 2.40 in the morning. So Yeah. <laughs> um, so another thing that um, we don't have to get too deep into it, but I um, that did come up is using something like bitterness as, as an example. Um, can you just talk briefly about the role of avoiding foods um, and if that came up a lot um, and what that has to do, you know, whether it has to do with uh, evolution or socialization or just things like bitterness and other things we don't like. Yeah, that's a great question. So, so bitterness evolves to, to warn us away from foods. It's kind of a dance with plants. So plants evolve toxins and we evolve bitter taste to stop eating that plant. Uh, you know, it's, it's to sit, tell us don't stop eating it. And and so bitter is really this response. As, as humans, we figured out how to make some things that are um, that are bitter and that were dangerous, no longer dangerous. And so hops, if you ate too much hops, it would be dangerous. But if you add a little bit of hops to a beer, it alters the, the beer and, and is not really dangerous to you. And so we can learn to like that in part by learning to like the aromas. And so you have this the stick, which is where you start, and then you have the learning superimposed on it. The, the other learning that I think is really interesting, and, and um, I think it's one to be aware of because it plays into our biases, is that we, innate, we the way our biology works, we learn to love our own foods most. And, and that can be beautiful right? to, to love your familial foods, but we also very often learn to dislike other foods. And, and so this then leads cultures when they interact often to have um, these disgust responses at these interfaces of cultures into which power dynamics often play. And so many Native American uh, uh, foods were fermented in very different kinds of fermentation from those associated with Western Europe, uh, Southwestern Europe. And, 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 and so, Western Europeans in confronting these foods uh, really stigmatized them so that a lot of traditional North American fermented foods stopped being made. And there was a stigma to, for example, fermenting uh, a lot of mammal meats. And so, so the same thing that, that's associated with learning to love something can be, can also trigger these terrible responses. And, and so I, I think it's, really important to be aware of when that that's that's going the wrong way and we see it all the time when you see um what's the weirdest food in the world what's the stinkiest food in the world 
th th that's playing into that same system again. Um, and, and, and so I think, yeah, that learning has all kinds of dimensions. Sorry to go on in that, but I will be. No, um, uh, a question here from our audience. Uh, is a preference for flavor diversity more unique to humans or are there examples in the animal kingdom? So, so we, we don't know. Um, I mean, olfaction has been the neglected sense and, and people like Gordon Shepard doing amazing recent work uh, have really started to show us that olfaction is incredibly powerful and important. Uh, but because a lot of it, that work is so recent, there are a lot of obvious things we don't know. And, and so it seems like flavor diversity is something we like or aroma diversity, um, but it's not been well tested and you could test it. Uh, so maybe there's a graduate student out there who wants to do some zoo studies because you could do it. But as far as I know, no one's done it. Interesting. Um, do you know or is there any sort of conclusive answer to why kids generally don't like vegetables, at least for a while? Yeah. So, so um, bitter tastes are very strong in, in kids where they've been well studied. And so one argument that's made is that young kids should, should be uh, particular. There should be more of a warning system for kids. And, and so maybe the warning system is on high alert to tell those kids who are wandering around chewing on things, please don't eat this. You haven't learned yet. For the love of God, don't eat it. Um, it's not super well understood, but that would be the adaptive ju just so story, um, and which makes sense. It's plausible. Yeah, that's a that's a good scientific answer <laughs> for the <laughs> frustration of kids not liking vegetables. Um, well, I'll just leave it with one more sort of open-ended question. Um, do you have any thoughts about our current access to food and how much, you know, what it might do for us as a species going forward? Yeah, I mean, I lots of thoughts. Um, maybe a, a simple thought that relates to the talk is that um, industry, the food industry is like that, the fruit that tricks our taste receptors. Um, and the food industry is figured out amazingly clever ways to prov provide foods that don't give us very much, but lead us to want more. And on the other hand, food complexity and food richness and appreciating aromas and all of these things, it seems whimsical and frivolous and like a luxurious affluent thing to do. But, but I think if we're serious about nutrition um, and local foods and valuing uh, nutritious foods, that learning to value these other dimensions of the foods is actually very much in line with beginning to eat um, more nutritiously as well and beginning to, to eat as part of more sustainable food systems. And, and, and so, you know, on the one hand, what could be less important than thinking about our ancestors and how pleased they were? On the other hand, I think it relates very much to the decisions we make every day. Mm -hmm. um, one other question that's that's come in um, is just a question about how we know what's poisonous. Is that something you address in the book at all? Yeah, yeah um, we, we do. So, so in the context of spices, so spices are interesting because they're they're all of the things we feature as spices. Those dominant aromas are meant to warn us, and their bitterness is also meant to warn us. Mm -hmm. And yet we've embraced them, and so there's kind of a tension between their danger and uh, how we use them. And that's really interesting. And it's relatively late. Um, the oldest documented spice use is like 12,000 years ago, which from paleoanthropological perspective is like yesterday. And, and so it's, it's something we started, at least as we understand it now, to do relatively late. And so that dance, I think, is an interesting way to think about th those dangers. And, and, uh, and of course, there are, our taste receptors don't evolve very quickly. And so when we move into a new habitat, sometimes there are poisonous plants that we didn't evolve with. And so our taste receptors don't tell us they're bitter. And so we can also get tricked in that way too. Interesting. Um, I would encourage everyone watching, if you wanna dive into this further, uh, pick up a copy of the book. You can buy it through our bookstore partner, Elliott Bay Books. Um, there is a link in the chat and I'll, I'll drop another one here at the end. Um, and thank you so much for staying up so late and. Um, 
being with us here and on behalf of Town Hall. Thank you all and have a good night. Thank you so much. And donate to Town Hall. It's a wonderful program. Donate lots and lots. Thank you all. Thank you.